Uh, Father, thank you for the incredible celebration that communion is of your life in us and ours in you. Thank you, Jesus, that it was your blood that the new covenant was crafted from, that your sacrifice has completely eradicated sin as an issue between us and the Father. I know it's hard to believe, Lord, but that's what this is a celebration of. Holy Spirit, I ask that you would make that known to us, that you would make it known not just in a doctrinal way or because I said it or because I'm praying about it now, but you would make it known in our hearts that we would have the awakening and the aha moment that comes realizing that this is really true, isn't it, Jesus? You really did destroy the power of sin in our lives. You didn't ignore it. You didn't excuse it. You didn't mask over it. You didn't substitute something else for it. You became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God. You're the answer to the questions that sin raised, to the depression that it created. You're the answer to the sense of alienation and hostility that it formed in us. You're the answer to the death. The death that for us would have been an end, but turned out only to be a beginning for you. A beginning of a covenant in which the Father delights in accepting us. And he loves us the way he's always intended to love us. He's free from the hindrances of, of uh, sin and, and uh, all of the judgments that were a part of that and all of the other problems that separated and alienated and, and tortured both humanity and your intentions for us, Father. So I thank you that as we celebrate your body and blood today, as we celebrate that, Lord, that uh, we would be transformed from the inside out to believe with every fiber of our being in your love. I like what you shared with Nancy and through her. Are you ready for love? Well, you are. (laughs) You are, and this proves it. And so we are too. We say yes. Jesus, thank you for your shed blood, for our forgiveness and your broken body for our wholeness. Amen. Amen. All right, so let's see here. Who can I get to help me? Could you help me, sir? Why don't you just go around and share this, and when you give it to him, just say, uh, bless you with the body of Jesus. <laughs> Doug, would you do, or Greg, would you do that? Thanks. In our evolving communion, uh, we have both juice and wine. You can make your choice. Juice is on the outside, and wine is on the inside. I thought about a hundred different ways to try to lay it out so that it wasn't prejudiced in one way or another. (laughs) I wasn't able to figure it out. So anyway, would you mind helping? Just bless folks with these. So yeah, the one around the outside is the juice, one in the middle is wine. Thanks. And then uh, just just hold those for a little bit. Doug, you want to help with this one? Thanks. And I have more if we run out, and I have more if you spill. So, I have these things. <laughs> all right. Bless you guys. Uh, all right. If it gets too weird holding the elements, we'll, we'll take it in the middle. All right. I want to review just for a second. Now, um, at 6.30ish or so, I pointed out that on your table are some post-it notes, and those are so you can write down a question or anything along those lines. Also, there's going to be an opportunity to share a little bit. But I want to review, because some of you are uh, new here tonight and haven't been here both the last two weeks or maybe either of the last two weeks, which is totally cool. Stick this up here. Okay. Something that I feel like the Lord has shared with me that I have been sharing with you guys for two weeks is that one of the keys that we have, um, one of the keys that we have about understanding this love of God, which is beyond our understanding, and it's beyond what most of us have given ourselves to or are comfortable giving ourselves to it. One of those keys is the new covenant. 
And part of the reason I think it's so important is because the way we think about the New Covenant reveals a ton about how we think about God. And how we think about God is a monstrously big deal about how we live our Christian lives. And so I, I'm going to see if I can sketch out just three quick ways. So, um, okay, here goes my drawing ability for a second. All right, so here's... There's the Father, okay? And here's uh, Jesus. Jesus has a beard. And then here's the Holy Spirit. And that's, uh, it looks like Batman, actually. But it's not, it's the Holy Spirit. <laughs> and that's the Holy Spirit's wings, okay? All right, so this is like a depiction of the Trinity. All right, so we're not, th- this is one way that it's critical for us to think about God. The Trinity was one of those other keys. I think the third key is judgment. If we can work through those three keys, I think we'll have something going on. So this is one way to, to, to think of God. Another way to think of God is that you have Jesus uh, on the cross. A lot of people think primarily that. You have the Holy Spirit like a dove out here someplace. You could also have Jesus at his baptism or Jesus at any other significant event that the Gospels create. And then you have up here someplace, you have God the Father. And, and something's going on. Now, in some really unfortunate theologies, you have this uh, stuff being poured out on that wrath and all that kind of stuff. But there's this distinction issue. So my question is, where are we in either of these two pictures? If you think in terms of this, almost always you're going to think of us standing down here like this. Does that make sense? That somehow Jesus is between us and the Father. He's dying to give us an opportunity. He's rising to give us an opportunity or something along those lines. If you think of God like this, you still have the opportunity to think that we might be out here. But you also have the opportunity to think that we're right in here. Or more specifically, right in there. Now, I covered that little illustration some time ago. The way we think about the New Covenant reveals a lot of how we think about Jesus and how we think about ourselves and how we think about God. So, in this arena, what this did, for instance, maybe there was wrath pouring down, What this all did, and the Holy Spirit was circling around here to make sure this whole thing came off good. What this did is it created a new covenant. So here's the new covenant that was built like this. Here's the Father, and here's Jesus. Jesus was successful, and so he's reaching out, and the Father's reaching out, and they're shaking hands, making a deal. And maybe they're making a deal, and all, we're all back here. And we're hoping like crazy that deal works out because everything about us and God depends on uh, Jesus pulling this deal off with the Father. Have any of you ever thought of the New Covenant like that? Okay, <laughs> I got a hand in the back. The way I talked about that before is that we're like, we're like uh, uh, named parties in a class action lawsuit. So back in uh, Philadelphia someplace, there's a high-powered attorney firm named Jesus. And then there's this mess going on uh, with, uh, you know, something was all messed up in this company. And the, the attorney was fighting for our rights. And we're little, you know, people on the long, long list of a class action lawsuit. And there's this huge distance between us, kind of characterized by this. But this is one view of the New Covenant, all right? Uh, another view of the New Covenant is, or, or a likely view of the New Covenant, if you think like this, is that once their handshake is done and the deal is sealed, then Jesus goes zoop, and he goes up to heaven. And so now there's Jesus, and he's there with heaven. And the Father goes up to heaven, zoop, because he's always been in heaven, and he's there, and Jesus is at his right hand, which that would be his left hand, I guess, but Jesus is at his right hand, And we're left down here, and there's this document or this contract. 
and it has all these different things on it, and then it's signed by Jesus, and signed maybe by the Father. It's got blood on the corner of it. Does that relate to anybody? All right. In this sense, most people are going to look at the new covenant just like they look at uh, the forgiveness of sin or salvation. They're going to look at it as an opportunity. Your slate's been cleaned, Matt. And so uh, the condition of you after your slate has been cleaned is God looks at you and you're all clean. And Jesus is covered for you. And now you are a clean person just waiting to get dirty again. I mean... What else could you do if that's the nature of it? If you're washed completely clean, there's not a stain or a mark on you. There's no place to go except down, kind of, <laughs> in that scenario. So that, that's the way a lot of people think. Okay, now over here, this is a whole different ballgame. Yes? Some people say, Jesus took my place. Okay. You mean on, on this here? Okay, so um, did he? No. Well, <laughs> maybe. Uh, uh, there's a better way to think about it. There's a better way to think about it. All right, let's start over here. Let's assume that there isn't this distance in here, and th these. Individuals, the, the, the Spirit, the Father, and the Son are not working at cross purposes with one another, but they're working in this kind of familial hug, this kind of togetherness. And then the Bible talks about us being in Him, or in John chapter 12, Jesus says, uh, when, uh, when I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto myself, or actually says all things. So uh, there's a crossover here too. Okay, and, the, and the, what happened on the cross is the, the point at which the new covenant was created. So, and, and Jesus is on the cross. Jesus is on the cross. But what, what the scripture says, for instance, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 18, is that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. Okay, or the cosmos to himself. So that also means that the Father was in Christ. Not necessarily crucified in the same way because the incarnation made something possible through the Son that was not necessary through the Father. It also means that the Holy Spirit, if we're going to depict the Holy Spirit like that, was on the cross. It wasn't like this. Separate functions. It was like this, a joint effort. Does that make sense? Now, I want to tell you, as best as I understand the scripture, that is true. And so this is what, what Richard is saying, is that in this disjointed way over here, where the Father was having justice satisfied, where the Holy Spirit was doing only God knows what, because there's no depiction of that, and that Jesus was here bearing the wrath of God, paying for sin, becoming sin, that he was taking our place against this stuff, this wrath stuff. He was taking our place against wrath, against judgment, against the displeasure, the hot anger of the Father, and all this kind of stuff. So that was all getting on Jesus instead of getting on us. When this is all said and done, if that's the case, we're still left, after all of this, out here. And that's where I was trying to point out with the thing illustrating that about if we're just left clean, then we're still basically on our own. We're not in a different position at all. We're not in a different place. We're not in a different covenant or anything else. But this is totally different. If, in fact, God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, and if, in fact, the blood spilt here was the grounds for this new covenant that we're in, then the covenant is not like a contract. The covenant is like an embrace or like a relationship. Or I even like talking about it like a land. It was like the place that was birthed out of this. And so over here, if, if we are in Christ, 
if literally we take it literally, that he drew all into himself, then the act that went on here by God was an act that drew all of us who had been living sort of independent right into Jesus. And when the whole thing was over, we had two different conclusions. We had a new covenant that was crafted in this act by God and man. The man, Christ Jesus. Now you can come up with the same thought over here where Jesus is the incarnate son and he's making his half of the deal. You can come up over here, but we're still the ones that begin to answer this thing. This one, we find ourselves, like I say, two, two different things changed. One, all has been drawn into him. And when this deal was finished, we ended up atoned for by that blood, clean, like we are in the other scenario, but also in him, in a different place. And so, th does that make some sense? Okay, so let me read the scripture and explain why we need to think about the new covenant as part of that. And then if you have questions or thoughts, I really would like to make some time tonight to do it. Yeah. It's what? Yeah. Yeah, it is. Everything that, that is tried to be explained by this is all based on the destruction that sin is perceived to have wrought on God's purposes in creating man. Over here, it's all taken care of as well. But, the, but sin isn't the primary issue in this situation. Sin had to be dealt with. But the primary issue is this relationship right here being opened up and including us. Okay, so l let me read, read this thing in the New Covenant here. This is what I was covering for the last couple of weeks, and I know there's a few of you here that haven't heard it. Okay, so in Hebrews chapter 8, the criteria for this covenant is stated like this. Um, it says, for this is, this is in Hebrews chapter 8, verse 10. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my laws into their minds and I will write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they shall be my people. And they shall not teach everyone his fellow citizen and everyone his brother saying, know the Lord for all will know me from the least to the greatest of them because I will be merciful to their iniquities and I will remember their sins no more. Okay, now I don't know anybody that just blows that off or disagrees with that theologically, no matter which side of the camp you come down. But you can see how all of this inner transformation stuff, this inclusion stuff, fits a lot better over here than it does over here. Because over here, you still end up, even if, if God, through this contract of the, of the new covenant in this form, he puts his law in your heart or something, you're still an independent agent now with the law of God in your heart. He's going to be your God. It's in kind of a sense over here. It's not going to be because we're connected organically. So uh, the thing I learned, and this is a bit of review for those of you that weren't here. The thing I learned is that the uh, word that leads into verse 12 is the word for because. And what it refers to is the stuff up here earlier. And it says that all of this stuff... Uh, me putting my law in your minds and writing them on your hearts, me being your God, you being my people, uh, you not having to tell people, I know the Lord because everybody's going to know him. That is all because I am going to have mercy on your unrighteousness. And I am going to no way, not ever, and I don't have time to go over that again, but it's a personal double emphatic. The Lord is saying, no way, not ever will I recall that as a part of your identity from this day forward forever. So he's saying that this new covenant and all these criteria, these relational things of the knowledge of God, the, the, the indwelling of the word and the personal relationship without qualification of me being your God, you being my people, all of this is because I am going to have mercy on your unrighteousness and forget your sins. Never remember them again. So I asked the question, how is it possible for a righteous God to do that? And the answer is Jesus, because all of the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, were in Christ, settling the sin issue, reconciling the world to himself. 
And so over here, however you perceive these, these distances and these uh, contractual arrangements and stuff, try to lay that aside and think in terms of this sort of closeness. Every experience that Jesus felt on the cross was fully experienced and felt by the Father and the Spirit because of the nature of the Trinity. They are of one essence, of one being. Every hope that the Father had to be our God and for us to be his people was fully engaged in the Spirit and in the Son on the cross. Jesus was not at all confused what the outcome of this was going to be. And it wasn't just a bunch of independent agents who were clean, getting ready to get dirty again. It was people in relationship to the Father as that had been made from the very beginning when Jesus was engaged in creating him in the first place. So this is a huge issue. Every, the, the idea of the law, Jesus was not confused about the nature of the law. He didn't see this act as in competition with the law. He saw this act as fulfilling and making obsolete that remote law. This is a picture of a new covenant that would be exactly like the old law. A contract that you were a party to, but you still had to fulfill it. This is a totally different thing. Where was the law? In, in, no, let me put it another way. In whose heart was the law first in? In whose heart was the law of God first in? Fathers? It was in God's heart. It was an expression of God's heart. It wasn't an artificially made up thing. That's how God is. Just like the characteristics, nice job, Janet. Just like the characteristics of love talked about in 1 Corinthians 13. God is love. So love didn't come as an outside set of rules from some book or something. Love came out of the heart of the Father because God is love. So this righteousness and all that the law represents belongs in here. It was just an articulation of it. And now it's in us like it's in him. Because we're in him. This thing pulled everything together. Okay? All right. The reason that the Father can forget about my sins and the reason he can meet every one of my unrighteous things with mercy is because of what Jesus did. Do you agree? Not just because in some distant sense, like the left-hand side, because the Father, it is a constant presence right with him. Here's my son. He's right at my right hand. You're never going to be able to bring a sin. You're never going to be able to bring a sin to me as I represent the Father that I'm going to find insufficiently dealt with right here. It's not possible. So it's not just a senile act. It's not, just a, it's not even just a generous act on the part of the Father to forget our sins and to greet our transgressions with mercy. It's because, oh yeah, I see that thing that's misshaping you. I see that thing that's distorting you, that's hurting you. I also see it in Jesus. He was made that so that I can make you my righteousness. Do you see that? There's no distance. There's no uh, judge sequence. There's no bunch of parties like that. Now, if we can believe that, then what I'm beginning to find out in my own life, and what I really want to uh, help you guys experience, is that your life can actually change. How you think about God can actually change. If we go just a tiny bit further into Hebrews uh, 9 and so on, let me read a couple things to you. In 9.12, it says, And not through the blood of goats and calves, but through his own blood, he entered the holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and ashes of heifer sprinkling on those who have been defiled sanctify for the cleansing of the flesh, how much more would the blood of Christ, now listen to this, how much more would the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. We're not talking like we're talking in this vision of the new covenant, that there's a shedding of blood 
and a shielding of wrath or an absorption of wrath so that a deal could be struck and there's a contract that now makes it okay for you to come into the presence of the Lord. What we're talking about is the active work. Did you hear it in there? That Jesus offered himself by the eternal spirit to God so that everything that would separate or alienate us can be done away with in our heads, taken away. We have a clean conscience. The reason, if there's a reason that you don't serve the Lord effectively, that you hesitate to come into his presence, that you uh, are afraid that you're not measuring up, you entertain thoughts about not being good enough, it is because you feel like you're falling short of the glory of God. Like there's the glory out here. And you're going, man, I know everyone's sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. I feel that. I feel the impact of that. Well, let me tell you something about that. Over here, this is a perpetual problem. Over here, it isn't a problem at all. Because Jesus did not fall short of the glory of God. As a matter of fact, he manifests the glory of God. That's why when he prayed, Father, I pray that uh, these that you've given me will be with me where I am so that they may see my glory. That's why it says, uh, when Paul's instructing us about looking at Jesus, that where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty in, in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, I think it is, toward the end. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. For we all with unveiled faces, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being changed from glory to glory as from the Lord of the Spirit. In other words, your transformation and my transformation takes place in this context, in this relationship. And that is why it's not like it's okay for us to sin, but I got news for you. It's, it's an inevitability. You're going you're, you're gonna to do that because what you're doing is you're, you're being transformed from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of of, of the son of his love. And so there is a discipleship process here. There is a change in our thinking that's going on, but it's going on wholly within this relationship, wholly within this purpose. So there's no part of you that's out here trying to work your way that way on your own. And that's why when we get the ability to come to the Lord with our ugliness, confident or at least hopeful that he's going to in fact do what he said and that's greet us with mercy we're going to begin to experience the reality of the new covenant where God was in Christ reconciling the entire cosmos to himself and uh, how many of you have made progress recently as we've been talking about this or anything in, in being able to go to the Lord and, and shed quickly that shame or the sense of failure or anything like this. Just, anybody? Okay. I asked Vicky today, I go, is anybody changing in relation to it? I really want us to do this because not only do I want you guys to be free, I want you to be free because that's what Jesus died to make us. It's really important we be free, not just for your own personal liberty to run around and, and act goofy or whatever, it's really important because that's why Jesus came, was to take us out of darkness and bondage and bring us into the glorious liberty of the sons of God. And it's also important because creation is waiting for that to happen. Our neighbors are waiting for that to be revealed. Your grandkids, your friends, they all just want to see somebody who's free in Christ. They don't, there's no other way for them to get delivered. There's no other way for them to become who they are. And so the first step for us, and the reason I think that the new covenant is the key to this, is that if we can repent from thinking that it's a contract of which we have been made a party, and so we're either waiting around for the payoff or we're, uh, we're back in a position where we have to keep up our half of the contract, Thank God we've got the Holy Spirit, or thank God, whatever. If we can get to the point where we realize that when Jesus... Okay, we're celebrating Christmas in just a few days. 
more than any other thing that Christmas should be a celebration of in our minds is that the eternal word of the Father became a human being without ceasing to be the eternal word of the Father. All the imagery of Christmas is fine. I'm not even bugged by materialism and Christmas trees and stuff as much as I used to be. It's just irrelevant to to worry about. What we should be thinking about is that the eternal word of the Father, the second person of the Trinity, became a human being and was touched beginning as a as a fetus, as a zygote, um, with the feeling of our infirmities. Every experience of vulnerability and weakness that we have, he has felt. He never lost sight of the Father. He never quit believing that he was the Son and loved. He worked his way through that, through rejection by his family, through uh, demonic assault, through political uh, corruption around him, all of the stuff that went on, and ultimately he found his way into the worst place of humanity, and, and he destroyed it by loving the Father from that position. By loving it, by never losing sight of that. He was the light that enlightens every man. Then, now it makes sense to me why he said in John 12, when I be lifted up, or when the Son of Man be lifted up, he'll draw all to himself. That means that we're all in him And that the Father is now dealing with humanity through Christ. And we're in him. And I don't know how to illustrate it. I suggested a couple weeks ago those little nested dolls or something. But the reality is you and I are in Christ. And Christ is in the presence of the Father. He's in him. He's in us. We're in him. And so the way the Father has wanted and chosen to act with men forever until he was limited by men's sin and rebellion and turning away and rejection of his presence. And just think about all of the events in the Old Testament where they said, no, we don't want you to talk to us. God honored all that stuff. But now he doesn't have to honor it because he has an embrace relationship with humanity in his son. And you and I are in it. Now, he recognizes that we are coming out of darkness into light. And that's why when we bring darkness to him, it's an opportunity. It's nothing that will offend him. It's nothing that he needs to be repulsed by. Does that make sense? I I was with a friend. He and his buddy were buying a house online. And... The house needed some repair. And the reason it was cheap was because there was things wrong with it. And so I was explaining to Dennis this concept. And he said, that's kind of like Chuck. Chuck is his partner. And Chuck's been a builder forever. So if you and I were going to go buy a house and the realtor took us in there and there was a big hole in the drywall and there was drywall stuff all over the ground and there was a, a split visible in the pipe and the water was turned off, We'd probably, for the most part, go, ugh, I don't want to do that. When Chuck sees that, he goes, wow, what an incredible opportunity. This broken piece of this house increases its value to me because I can get it for less. Now, the the illustration eventually breaks down because it costs God a lot to get it. But my point is this, the perspective on the brokenness is totally different for a guy who sees it as something that can be redeemed or has been redeemed than it is for a person who's just looking for a finished product. Over here, we're constantly looking at ourselves to see if there's a finished product. Constantly. And the liberty in this version of the New Covenant is that I don't have to do that anymore. Now, John says, if you say you have no sin, you make him out to be a liar. So I'm not suggesting that there isn't such a thing as repentance or confession or Lord, I'm sorry, or whatever the case is. Because these things that need to change as we are being carried from darkness in Christ into light, they're real and they do cause problems. But they're nothing to be shamed of. They're nothing to to hesitate to go to God about. So we go to God with our ugliness and that's kind of what I was hoping that you guys are picking up. This is a real thing. 
then scriptures that are a total mystery all of a sudden become crystal clear, like in 1 John. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins. Well, of course he is, because standing right here next to him is the reason that he can forgive freely. It doesn't require groveling on our part. We don't have to acutely remember every detail. We just calm. And he goes, yep, my son was made that so you could be forgiven. Does that make sense? But it's even more than that. Because John then goes on to say something that I will tell you straight up as a pastor. I didn't believe all my life because I had no place to put it. I mean, I believed it was in the scripture, but I didn't know how to talk about it. And it was this, that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, how can I be cleansed of all unrighteousness when I still have some unrighteousness? Well, it's because in this covenant... In this relationship, all of my unrighteousness has been dealt with actively, currently, once, forever in Jesus. And Jesus is standing as the one that is all of my unrighteousness undone. And so, of course, the Father can just jump right in and work on it. He can cleanse me from all of it. He can take it away. And if I don't react with shame and guilt and shrink back, then I'm in good shape. That's how I grow. And that makes what Paul said make sense. That we all with unveiled faces, beholding it as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord, are literally being changed from glory to glory. And so then change in our life is, is glorious. Because it's coming from the hand of the Father. The Father doesn't ever have to go, ooh. He doesn't have to. Matter of fact, and this was one last bit of review before we try to get some questions in. Um, if the Father did react with something other than mercy, forgiveness, and forgetfulness to our sin, he would have to do so at the expense of what he clearly knows better than anybody else in the universe, Jesus has already done. Because there's no confusion in the eyes and heart of the Father about how thoroughly Jesus has taken care of our sin because they're one. He knows it. I don't pretend to know what, what the sensory input is when the Father sees me carrying something ugly. But it is an immediate recognition of that thing being dealt with fully in Jesus. It has to be, because everything that Jesus knows and experienced, the Father knows and experiences. The Spirit knows and experiences. So when the Spirit is leading me to, to, to come and, and not be ashamed and to look into the face of the Father, He's doing that in the full awareness, too, that Jesus has fully dealt with that. And so honestly, guys, if we can just get this one principle, if we can understand that all of this stuff in the New Testament is because we don't have to be ashamed. God doesn't have to be hesitant. The Father is free to love us. I believe that we can grow and we can be like Teflon on the sins of this world and the accusations of the enemy. I believe that it is an unlimited potential for partnership and fellowship with Jesus and we can just be happy and we can be righteous and this stuff can be melted off of us or worked off of us. God can get his hands dirty getting rid of those concepts in our lives that are lies and so on and, and, and we're going to be able to carry literally the good news that Jesus has done it all and that we're in him. Does that make sense? Okay. How about questions or anything? Does, uh, does any of this seem too good to be true? Uh, yeah, Dave. Hey, hang on. Uh, I want to get it on tape real quick. Well, one other perspective um, from Hebrews 9 is in the Old Covenant, the priest had to go into the holy place annually mm -hmm. to make atonement. And it says in Hebrews 9 that in the New Covenant, Jesus went into the holy place. His blood satisfied that atonement forever. Mm -hmm. So it's not we have to wait annually for the high priest. Or to, repeatedly at or any re cycle. Right, it's yeah. done. Exactly. And, and even in Hebrews 9.15, it talks about that for a will to go into effect, somebody has to die. So there was blood in the Old Covenant. Jesus' blood is the New Covenant. And when you think about it, a wheel doesn't get re-implemented 
time after time after time after time. A will is a one-time thing. Right. An inheritance is granted. That's the new covenant. Just once it was done. Right, right. Okay, so two points out of that. That's really good. Two points out of that. That's what I'm saying when I say that God cannot dishonor what Jesus has done, the finished nature of it, by holding you accountable for part of it. And, and accountable is even the wrong word. He can't do anything except just see, oh, yeah, I see this issue. I'm so sorry that you're hurting with that. Jesus has taken care of that. Let me prove that to you. Let me prove it with love. Let me prove it with transformation. Let me prove it with discipline. Let me prove it with all of those sorts of things. And if you go further into Hebrews, you see all of that. A father disciplining his son, faith being pulled out, editing of our lives. Think about Sarah. Think about Sarah. Most of you here know the story of Sarah mocking, laughing, and accusing God in Genesis, I think it's 18 or something, when they came by. But if you read the account of Sarah in Hebrews, it's Sarah believed God, and it was counted righteousness. That's God's editorial system in Christ. Because the mocking that she did, Jesus bore. The doubt she had, Jesus bore. You see that? So all that's left is what is real about Sarah. And, uh, and then the other thing is not on God's perspective, it's on ours. It's on ours. We can't keep bringing this stuff up all the time. We can't keep coming under it all the time. Because you're right, once it's executed, it's executed. We're not the ones. The, um, I talked with a friend, family member actually, and their understanding was along this line. And so there was two groups of people. There were the people over here, bunches of them. And then there are the people over here. And the difference between these two groups, or these two individuals is really what she was talking about, was that these people had uh, confessed and the blood had applied to them, and they were in the new covenant. These people were not. But that's crazy. That's crazy. Because God was in Christ reconciling the whole cosmos to himself. Because there's no place outside of him, according to Colossians. Now, there are people who are in this relationship that don't know it. And one of the reasons they don't know it is they need you and I, who do know it, to tell them. To begin to pull that from them. You're not who you think, and God's not who you think. So yeah, it's a one-time... If, if it were other than a one-time, it would be exactly like the other covenant. It would have no choice but to be exactly like the old one that it replaced. Anybody else? Thoughts, questions, challenges? Janet, hang on. Thanks. I've always had this ongoing question with the Lord about um, why did you have to shed your blood? <laughs> you know, why blood? You know, why? I don't, just really trying to grasp it and understand it. And uh, not that I question it, I'm just trying to understand it, you know. And I felt like he told me this week, um, and this is all kind of just confirming it, that um, it just kind of came on like a light bulb that his, his shedding his blood and dying was his no way, never. Again. Again, from this day forward. his no way to our sin yeah. will it ever be remembered again. It was like a, a passionate thing he did that said no way. So yeah. that's it. Any other Does anybody have, uh, please be courageous if this is the case. Do any of you have a question saying, hey, I just don't get it or I, I, I don't, it, it seems too broad or it seems too easy. Um, Richard's got his hand up. I don't know if that's his question, but if you have that question, I really would love for us to try to talk If it was just the blood that had to be shed, why did he get beat to a pulp? Why do you think? To give us the full benefits of all that it was uh, take place. I think that's, that's part of it. I think it was the nature of, our, of man's hatred for God. If all he had to do was just die, he could have just died, right? But the issue was, was 
was to get into the dark place that we were in. Because that's the place. Okay, here's another important point about that. Okay. Most of us grew up in Western rational Christianity with a, a really strong sense that we should be good. And we better be good. Otherwise, Santa's not going to give us what we want. And then that was translated into God and a bunch of different stuff. The reality is, it is the, it is the worst of us that God made the redemptive covenant from. Not the best. It's the worst. And if that's not true, if, it's, if that wasn't reflected in men's hatred, in men's political corruption, in men's religious determination to, by God, I am going to be righteous and seen as such. If that's not where Jesus met with us, then we all still have that to fear. But the truth is we don't have it to fear. Because he burrowed right into that, accepted all of that, submitted himself to every one of those things. The cruelty, the abuse, all that stuff. And, um, and he won. He won. That's why there's nothing you can come to the Father with that he can't receive with mercy. Because Jesus has already dealt with that. So it was as much of the emotional stuff, Richard, as just a payment like thing. It was the utter confusion we had about how much God loved us and who He was and who we were and stuff. I don't know more than that. Yeah, Sonny, hang on, right? I'll be right back. Kind of the way I see that is it says that he was beaten beyond being recognized as a human. So I think that's a little bit about what you're talking about is in our confusion and where, what we became was unrecognizable to the original intent and that was all in, absorbed in Jesus. Yeah. 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 There's nothing left unassumed. There's nothing that Jesus hasn't embraced of our corruption. Nothing. Nothing. The worst decisions we've made, the, the most selfish, stupid, there's just nothing. There's nothing left for us to fear as we approach the Father. There's nothing left for us to think we might not end up being loved. That's where he says there remaineth no other sacrifice. Mm -hmm. And he said it's finished. Amen. That's where he said it. Amen. Amen. That's true. It either is or isn't. Uh, uh, let me ask you another question. This is a, an important bit of understanding. What does it mean that it's finished? Now, I don't want you to try to explain it to me. Because I don't know. I don't even know what it was. In other words, I don't know the depth of the problem. I just know that it was messing me up really bad. And I see the effects of it everywhere. But there is one who knows. The Father knows and sees the depth of the problem of sin. Right? And he knows that when Jesus said it was finished, he knows what finished means. I still don't. But then I don't have to. Because getting all of that knowledge right is not what puts me in a good What gets me in that position is this work of Jesus. I mean, like, think back when you, um, when you came to know the Lord on the basis of, of somebody telling you you need to confess your sins. How many here believe they confessed 100% of their sins when they did that? How about 90%? 80? 50? How many of you, if you were to be honest, okay, and you were kind of in that moment, and there was this instruction, and there was the pressure of that instruction. How many of you just sort of picked and choose ones that were serious enough to let them know you were serious, 
but didn't actually reveal the most disgusting things you thought about yourself. <laughs> We're managing that. Can't you see that? That's our efforts over here on the outside to try to meet up to this tremendous opportunity. And most of us recognize it as a wonderful opportunity. But we're trying to meet that up. And I'm saying that's not even the gospel, guys. The gospel is this, I, everything that I thought that kept me from you, Jesus has borne. And when you go to our neighbors, I mean, I, I don't really have my evangelistic formula figured out yet, but I know it's not to try to put a person in that kind of position where they got to come up with something ugly enough that it counts, but not so ugly that I think they're disgusting and call the police. How about this? Jesus has borne everything that you have ever done and more. He has done so willingly. He has done so in complete harmony with the Father and the Spirit. And as a result of that victory and that cry, it is finished. The Father no longer has to worry about being a judge. He no longer has to worry about any of that. He can be your Father like you hope. Something like that is what we're offering in the Gospel. Anybody else? Um, one of the things about um, that... I've sort of been talking to the Lord about it, about sin. <clears throat> and it's this idea that throughout the day, if something takes place and you sin, you know, it, it, it should be fairly easy for us if we are in the Trinity to just say, wow, Lord, I, I'm sorry, forgive me for that. I blew it, yeah. But the other thing is, is to ask the follow-up question, which is, why did I do that? Or why did I say that? Or why did I participate in that? Because sometimes the issue isn't um, the thing that you did. It's the reason behind the thing that you did. And that's the thing that the Lord's going after. And I think the, the neat thing about being in him is that you don't have to fear asking the question because he loves you. <laughs> Jesus it, you know, he did die for you. The Holy Spirit is your counselor and your comforter and your teacher. And so in the, in the, for me, this gets very practical in my daily life because I'm willing when I'm doing something that I, and, and it can be as innocuous as anything or it can be as vicious as vicious can be. But I want to be able to be a person that takes that to the Lord and figures out, okay, with the Lord, why would I allow myself to do that? Why would I allow myself to say that? Why would I allow myself to participate in that? And have the conversation with him. Because being in him is reality. Being outside him is not. <laughs> and, and, and being able to have that conversation with no shame. No fear of rejection. No risk of rejection. No risk of rejection. There honestly is nothing that any of us are going to bring to the Lord that is going to catch him off guard and going to be beyond what Jesus has drawn when he drew everything onto himself. Did somebody say something over here? So my question is a little bit broader than just the, the sin and the forgiveness piece, but... Just going back to the fact that I'm in Christ and Christ is in me and it is finished and I now have his authority. So the application that I'm making before we even got started and you were praying for Dave's family member, why are we asking God to heal and why wouldn't we just release it? Why wouldn't we take authority and release God in us? Because we don't have to ask God to forgive us. He's forgiven us. I'm thanking him that he for forgives me and I'm, in, I'm righteous. And, I'm, and this whole time we keep talking about the inclusion and mm -hmm. 
in Christ and, and all the benefits of that. So it doesn't, I'm having a hard time processing asking God to do something that he's already paid the price, fully finished, done. And it's up to me to release that power of God to that person, I believe. Would you agree? Uh, well, I, I, I for sure don't have a good rebuttal. <laughs> uh, there, there's some compli- there, there's some uh, well, there's some factors here that are part of this. Yeah. One, yes, uh, Javon is in this covenant. He's included in everything that the Lord has done. So there's no sense of distance that we have to overcome by asking. There's uh, no sense of uh, there's no. It's not like Javon is in a another place that we've got to get Jesus to go to, or we've got to get the Holy Spirit to go to. So. Um, like I said, I don't have a rebuttal to that. It, he says heal the sick. He tells us to do that. Yeah. I think you're right. It's, I'm just saying, I, I don't feel we have to step into that. I don't know, mediator, if you will, or, you know, asking and uh-huh. passive. And, and it's like, well, you have the inheritance. It's already there. Why are, you, why, are you, <laughs> why are you even asking me the question? Just like, Lord, would you forgive me? Well, I already have. It's your inheritance. It's already, it's already done. And I guess l- let, me, let me address my thought on the forgiveness thing. Uh, asking it as a question that might get a yes or no answer makes no sense to me. Saying, Lord, sorry, I blew it like you did, Ray, you know, like you, your words. That's just a relational thing with me right now. Maybe it's just because I'm still conscious of it or still, you know, seeing myself as in a, a relationship with it. Um, yeah, I would say that maybe it's not realizing, not realizing that that's all a part of that, where we are and who we are. Any thoughts on that? There's one more thing that I didn't say. Isaiah 53, 5, when it says, by his stripes we're healed, Mm -hmm. and it says all this stuff is, we're we're saved, healed, and delivered Mm -hmm. by his stripes. So So it's really not a unique event by event thing with us. Okay. Okay. Anybody else? Dave. We're going to take communion right after this. I kind of agree with Janet. Back to the forgiveness thing. Once again, if you think about the Old Covenant, as far as I know, the Israelites did not have to go to the priest and confess their sin or enumerate their sin. There was an annual atonement. Mm -hmm. And that took care of the sin annually. <clears throat> Jesus, on the other hand, took care of the sin perpetually and permanently. Mm-hmm. So I don't know that we even have to go through the list. It's more, it has been done. It was done annually in the Old Covenant. Mm-hmm. It's been done eternally in the New Covenant. Okay. And our sin is just done. Yeah. I know that there's a, in the, in the, old, in the old Covenant, there was a, a thing there in Hebrews that talks about sins done in ignorance, committed in ignorance. So those are clever. Uh, I, I think it's. I think you're right. I think it's that we don't realize it yet. And this is this is kind of what I believe the, the the new covenant, and particularly this, because of the new covenant, is so important for. It's because the thing that we don't realize we can actually participate in and reap the experience of. In other words, let's just assume for a second. And I'll use myself as an example. Let's assume that I don't realize that the forgiveness issue or the authority issue that Jen was talking about is, is completely settled in God's mind. And the only reason I wouldn't realize that is because it doesn't feel like it to me. I don't feel powerful or I don't feel clean, right? Or maybe because somebody says I'm not. They insinuate it, somebody I love or care for. I think he would never do that. But... Uh, you know, so, so what I'm saying is there are still factors in this life that can point 
or, or can seek to accuse us or deceive us. That's what the devil does. Most of my Christian life and most of my time as a pastor, I've wanted to fill you with so much positive information about God and what he thought about you and who he was that you could combat those feelings. But my experience is that's a losing proposition because there's a never ending flow of those accusations that can come against us. I like this because it doesn't matter what the accusation is. It doesn't matter what the stumble is. It doesn't matter the nature of the evidence against us being accepted and loved. If we'll just walk up to God, not shrink back. If we'll just walk up to him, we're going to feel the acceptance and it's going to erase the argument. Because honestly, most of my life as a teacher, I've tried to just hammer it into people. That, and then I've used the things like, well, you have to believe. You have to believe without doubting. How's that for putting a trip on somebody? <laughs> I'm not saying we don't have to believe, but I'm saying the place where belief comes is when you bring whatever you're under. So the deficit on the healing thing, it actually is a brand new, this is a brand new thing for me trying to step into that authority because always in my past, I tried to step, it, step into it as an authority based on a resolution of faith or a resolve personally. Now, I would much prefer to just be with daddy and realize that he sends me to those situations fully equipped. Now, I'm not there yet, but that's where I'm going with this. And, and it's the same journey, it, even if you're... Uh, if you're struggling with being, um, you know, feeling inferior or feeling confused or something like that. I just have a question to pose, like in regards to it, um, just because I think it, so we think of forgiveness um, and that place of why would we ask God for forgiveness? Um, and I just pose the question, if someone has deeply wronged you, Okay, like, I don't think anybody in this room has not been wronged before, okay? Uh -huh. Someone has deeply wounded you and wronged you, and they, they don't really care, right? They don't really have a place of really, hey, yeah, I, I messed up. It's just like, well, I'm sorry you feel that way, right? Yeah. Do we feel like that relationship is then still good, or is it broken? Because to me, if I have a relationship with somebody and they've wronged me, right, I can have grace and confront them and I can forgive them. But what happens if to them they've done nothing wrong, right? To them they've just done whatever they thought was right. So they have no reason to apologize. Right? There's no reason to apologize. God's forgiven me, so why should I have to talk to you? Right? To me, there's a broken relationship and a pride that creeps in that isn't of the Lord. And instead, I think it has more to do with us being his kids that are seen right with him, like it says in 1 John. It says, by this we know love, this is 1 John 3.16, that he laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and truth. By this we shall know that we are of the truth and reassure our hearts before him. For whenever our hearts condemn us, God is greater than our heart and he knows everything. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God, and whatever we ask, we receive from him because he keeps his commands to do what pleases him. Um, and this is his commandment, that we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he has commanded us. Okay, so your point is <clears throat> that even though objectively the transgression is fully covered in Jesus, the, uh, there's a passage in there that you read about our heart doesn't condemn us. 
Um, it doesn't throw up a wall. It isn't protective. It isn't this or that or the other. That if there is a reason for acknowledging some a wrongdoing, it's because of the, the relational part of it. I don't have a problem with that. I mean, I think that's really true, actually. Just because I know in my own life, I've had friends that um, were amazing, loved the Lord, gifted, and fell into sin and weren't repentant in any way for it. And their response and relationship to us personally was God has forgiven us and he's not bothered by our sin, so we're okay to continue in it. Uh -huh. And um, the result of that was pretty catastrophic. Um, and even in First John it says, if we're those that continue in sin but don't recognize it, that we don't even know his love, you know? Uh -huh. And so my thought is, yeah, we are forgiven, and how much more that is a place to rejoice and like be humbled in, so that if I find myself walking in any regard that's not soft before the Lord, and my heart is hard, or, or I feel condemned, or I feel ashamed, or something's there, in my mind, the best way to reconcile that is to communicate and to talk to the Lord and, and thank Him that He's forgiven me, thank Him that He's given me that love. But if I just say, well, I've been forgiven and move on, but don't actually reconcile anything to me, then it's almost like spinning in the face of forgiveness and forgetting His grace. Here's, here's where I would uh, throw a comment in is that to have a thought like that, that, that this whole forgiveness thing is like a transaction and God's already got it. This isn't a rebuttal at all of what you're saying, by the way. That's thinking in this kind of a construct. That, hey, there's a paper back in the lawyer's office in Philadelphia that says, I deserve this. And there's a separation, there's a distance, there's not a relationship. They're really, in this picture isn't any room for that at all. There isn't any room for that at all. And, and I think that that kind of view of forgiveness and that kind of reaction to it, that a person would, would try to, um, I don't know, use it as a shield or I don't know what. I think it means that, that this is how they're thinking about God. This is one reason why I think pondering the new, new covenant and learning to live in it is so important. Because if you think, here's the problem too, and you're right, the results are usually catastrophic, not just in breaking, I would guess, not just in breaking your relationship, but they end up 